Hi, my name is Dr. Jake Paul Fratkin. I want to talk about flu treatment and prevention with Chinese herbal medicine. Flu is getting a lot of attention right now. And of course, a lot of attention has been put on H1N1. Before that, it was called the swine flu. We have a series of flus that have happened in the last 100 years that are considered more serious than regular flus. But from a Chinese medicine point of view, it's not very different. How, what's important is the differentiation is how people are presenting and then how we're going to treat them. But I do want to talk a little bit about flu because there's a lot of concern out there right now. The big concern, I think, why there's so much reaction from the Center for Disease Control and from uh, demographers and scientists around the world is everyone's afraid of a repeat of the 1918 um, Spanish grip is what it was called then. And, and that was a very serious condition where at least 50 million people died and maybe up to 100 million people, all within six months. That was a, a horrific event that happened. And everybody's concerned that this might happen again. In that flu, people could be totally healthy and within 24 hours they could be dead. So it was very serious. And the bodies were piling up uh, all around the world. In St. Louis, uh, they had a photo of the train station with uh, hundreds and hundreds of bodies per day of people that had died. So everybody's worried that such a flu will happen again. So let's talk about what the difference is between a regular flu and uh, the so-called swine flus or avian swine flus. Influenza by itself, uh, it's been long recognized by Chinese medicine uh, symptomatically for what it is. And the etiology actually is not very much different than common cold, gan mao. But flu is much more contagious and much more serious. In a regular flu, we can expect the patient will have high fever uh, with chills and headache as, they, as the main uh, market symptoms. Uh, sometimes there's sore throat, not that often. Um, in some cases, there's vomiting and, and, and diarrhea. But most real flus come on very fast, within hours, and go into, uh, in adults, the fevers can go to 103, 103.5 within a number of hours, and stay up there for three days, four days, with a lot of headache, a lot of chills, a lot of shivering. Real flu is a pretty bad event. Now, the avian swine flus are combination um, mutations of the virus. First of all, all flus are avian flus. All flus are carried by ducks and geese. And, and usually from China, and they might, through migration patterns, ducks and geese will pass along flu. This is how it's usually spread. In an avian swine flu, there's a mutation. Now what happened in uh, 1918, probably uh, they were looking at ponds in South China where they were growing carp for food. And they were feeding pig manure onto the lakes to grow algae so the carp could eat it. And this is where um, a certain kind of a viral, a flu virus would mutate between two species. The, uh, the birds and the pigs. Uh, when it further mutates in a human host, you now have three points of mutation. And these are what we call the, the avian swine flus. Now, usually in a flu, the bird itself doesn't get sick. When the bird gets sick, then technically it's an avian flu. And, and what happened recently before this uh, H1N1 was there was the avian flu where the birds were actually dropping out of the sky sick and people that were handling the birds were getting flu. So these are all cross mutation flus. Something that's helped us a lot in Chinese medicine is what happened in 2003 with the SARS epidemic in southern China and Hong Kong because the Chinese studied this very closely. They gave a lot of information concerning the use of Chinese medicine for this flu, and it was actually quite a success for you for Chinese medicine. In that flu, you had these uh, markets in southern China where they would sell all sorts of animals as foods, and they were basically in bamboo-type cages, indoors, in a, in a room where you would combine reptiles, you would combine mammals, you would combine birds, 
and very unsanitary conditions, and this is where a mutated virus was allowed to happen. And once it got into a human host, it mutated again and it became very contagious. Once it gets into a human host, the trouble with these avian swine flus is they're very contagious. And this is what happened in SARS in 2003. SARS stands for Sudden Acute Respiratory Syndrome. It was mostly a respiratory um, presentation, but they also had a, a damp presentation with nausea and vomiting. And this gave the Chinese an opportunity to really look at what was working. Uh, in China, they, they basically were giving some advice to the practitioners of traditional Chinese medicine, and they were giving advice to the public. For the public, uh, recommendations were published in newspapers, they were actually uh, talked about on television. It was a big public health campaign telling people how to self-medicate with Chinese herbs. But to the doctors of traditional Chinese medicine, they were basically uh, proposing a, a combination approach. And the combination approach was based on when the, the Warren diseases theory that emerged in the late 1700s in China, where in that, in that historical period, uh, Chinese doctors had to address a lot of epidemic um, diseases that were coming into China, mostly from increased trade with European countries. So they were seeing more of everything, more smallpox, more tuberculosis, more diphtheria, more measles, and so on. And so they created this um, the Wen Bing theory. Wen Bing basically addressed heat syndromes and how heat syndromes would move into different parts of the body. So what they recommended in 2003 was to use Wen Bing as your foundation, but then to add in herbs with strong antiviral properties. This, um, this is a, a new development in Chinese medicine. And this sort of happened after 1949, after the founding of the People's Republic. During the 50s, there was a big health campaign to get people involved in public health issues. And they went around to small villages and they said, what do you have that the rest of the country might be interested in? And people came up with herbs, and people came up with hospital formulas, and cross-fertilized each other through information. So before 1949, if you look at traditional materia medica, there's maybe half a dozen herbs that we would consider to be um, antiviral, such as Lanisera ginyinua, such as Forsythia lientia. There is some prior talk about Isatis balangan. We also had Taraxacum pugongi, the dandelion. So we had some herbs in the classical literature, but after 1950, the category, which is really now we know this category, is clear heat resolved toxin, Chinger uh, uh, Jiedu. And this category, now if you look at uh, Bensky's Materia Medica, there's probably 35 herbs in this category. If you look at John Chen's Materia Medica, there's probably 50 herbs in this category. All these are newly discovered herbs with very strong antiviral properties, very strong. So you have 50 herbs now with strong antiviral properties instead of just six. And what the authorities were, were recommending in China was to add those in to your classical Wen Bing presentations. Try to find your differentiations and add in strong antiviral herbs. And these were things like Andrographis, Chuan Xin Lian. That herb is not, you won't find it in classical literature. They were relying on Isatis Banlanga. They were re relying on Hujang, which is a polygonum. They were relying on, um, uh, on other herbs that would fit this category. And you'll see them in various modern formulas. So this was the approach to the TCM doctors. Do a Wenbing differentiation and uh, add in antiviral herbs.